Hi, welcome to the L Rush Show, where I deliver content intended to inspire, educate, and motivate. Engage with me online at lrush.com and on social media. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone, just a quick one minute announcement to let you know about my virtual courses and free masterclasses. I have courses and free masterclasses based on both of my books. I have the Ultimate Thyroid Course. This is your answer to solving any thyroid issue, whether it be Hashimoto's, radioactive iodine, thyroidectomy after thyroid cancer, or just general hypothyroidism. Reverse T3 issues as well. It's an incredible value at 17 modules and 29 hours of content with amazing guest expert tutorials. I also offer the Ultimate Confidence Course. That is 15 modules and 14 hours with also a few guest expert tutorials. An incredible value. And I have free masterclasses on both of those topics as well. Visit lrust.com to learn more. Laban, welcome to the show. L. Russ, so great to be here with you. Thank you very much for having me. What a great day. Yeah, well, uh, listen, I love the title of your book, Bet on You, and uh, quite some harrowing experiences that led you to finally bet on yourself and stop <laughs> sabotaging your life. Um, <laughs> so let's just let's just start. Let's just start at the beginning because, you know, you're a podcaster now, you're an author, you run masterminds, you know, you're, you're the courage coach, right? So uh, it didn't seem there for a while, though, when you're reading about your life, that it was going to be uh, headed in the right direction. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about, yeah, your, your beginnings and uh, some of the tragic moments that led to you finally having a wake up call. Well, I'd love to share this, this with everyone uh, who's listening and for those that are listening i want you to to listen to this story like it's about you and and come to your own conclusion at once once i've finished because and there's a reason why and i'll explain later but really everyone has their own origin story and mine really was six and a half years ago i found myself at home, you know, on a Tuesday night, it was probably around midnight. I'd, I'd had three bottles of appropriately priced Pinot Noir that were coursing its way through my vein and sort of pounding its way into my liver. And I was gambling on a horse race in Hong Kong and I was in Melbourne, Australia. And I was such a, such a degenerate gambler that I didn't even have the TV on. I was just refreshing the, the sports betting page just to see whether my bets had come in. And on the betting screen on the on the laptop that I had positioned on my my legs there was a phone number for the gambler's helpline and I'd never seen this before and I and I'd been on the screen countless times before and and I just instinctively picked up my cell phone and I called this number and I spoke to the most extraordinary human being her name was Mary I'll never get to know her last name I don't think but I'm going to call her my Mary Magdalene because she was a guardian angel whether she liked it or not and for Al, for one of the first times in my life, I was actually able to to share what was going on in my life without fear of judgment. Mm-hmm. She just had that that angelic response about her, and 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 I just verbally diarrheaed all of my junk onto her, and she listened with the patience of a saint. And then she started sharing with me some harrowing statistics around the high rates of suicide that problem gamblers experience, and and that really scared me. She put me in touch with a uh, a gambling counselor a psychologist which was run via the salvation army in in australia there and it was paid for by the taxing the taxes from gambling losses so for one of the first times in my gambling career I actually got up <laughs> and that started a series of a year and a half of of sessions with her once a week for the first 12 months and then every fortnight for six months and in the first session she she asked me some questions about my mother and i burst into tears and uh, the floodgates just opened and she was able to share with me and, and allow me to understand about the coping mechanisms that children develop as a result of growing up in a less than nurturing environment, which for me was just being a child of divorce, right? And all the, <clears throat> all the escapism behavior, the drinking, the drugs, the gambling, the philandering, you know, the limiting beliefs and the negative self-talk and all the other crap that was going on in my life was all directly attributed to this, how I was handling my stuff. And it start, started me on this healing journey of, of wanting to reverse engineer everything that had happened to me so I could understand and then make change and make, uh, make a massive pivot in my life. 
And at the end of that year, this is in 2015, I gave up gambling. In 2016, on August 26th, I gave up alcohol and I've remained drug gambling, alcohol, philandering free for the entire time, <laughs> you know, with, with relative ease as well, I might add. Congratulations. Uh, let me ask you this, though. Sometimes, and I've known gambling, gambling addicts, uh, did you find through this process, though, that you were inclined to go to something else other than those things? Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Like to get that dopamine <laughs> hit. And did you catch yourself? And if so, I'd like to hear what those are, because, you know, sometimes because gambling can be like then with something else. That's not what we consider traditional gambling. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And the reason I'm chuckling is because you've made me think of something else that I didn't really pay attention to. During this sort of healing journey, right, I, I had a couple of relationships um, that were about 12 months long. But in between, I wanted to learn how to, to be better with women because I was useless at it, completely a cuckold little bitch, right? And, you know, trying to get women to like me so that I would sleep with them, so they would sleep with me. Rather. And I realized that wasn't working. So I started learning about this and I started dating and I went on 150 first dates over the course of a sort of a two year period through um, Bumble and Tinder. So I suppose that was one of um, a, a replacement addiction, but I was doing it to try and improve myself. The thing that really replaced all of the other stuff was when I inexplicably started running ultra marathons out of the blue in 2018 after never having been a runner and I went from running three miles as my longest distance in May, May 11th, 2018 to running the, uh, the Surf Coast Century, which is a 60 mile uh, trail run in Melbourne or in Victoria rather, uh, 16 weeks later. And I've since completed three 60 milers, um, a, a, a truckload more of the 30s and heaps of uh, marathons. So I suppose to answer your question, that's probably it. Well, that's a much healthier replacement. <laughs> well, I think so. I think so. And tell, I certainly... tell us what you noticed. Um, what were, um, I mean, you, you write about it in your book, but if you can sum up for the audience, what was it that you recognized about your mother and your childhood that made you realize that connection to the behaviors? Yeah, very great, powerful question. Because I know that will be piquing a lot of people's interest. So for me, like nothing more innocuous than growing up with parents that were ill-equipped to esteem themselves, let alone their children. Mm -hmm. And mum and dad split up when I was three and a half. There was custody battles. We were dropped off at foster homes at times and stolen from one parent to another. Like, and we were used as pawns for, mm -hmm. for leverage and all this other stuff. And, and really what it was, was just that my parents, who I both love and have forgiven a long time ago for this stuff, by the way, very important point. They, they, were, they grew up in terrible environments as well. They didn't have access to the internet. They didn't have access to Dr. Robert Glover. You know, they didn't have access to right. L. Russ. They didn't have access to this stuff. And, and yeah, some of it existed, but it was a lot harder to find. And I'm very blessed and fortunate to have had access to all this stuff so I could start figuring it out and not taking advice from people that don't have a clue about what they're talking about. Let's talk about the notion of, because... What it sounds like there to some people, and this always is the case when someone expresses what you did, which is you're explaining the perspective of understanding what they had and they were doing the best with what they had, even though that was nobody's best, right? But that was the best with what they have. It's an understanding. It's not an excuse, right? So some people are so reluctant to forgive or they think that somehow it is uh, okaying the behavior versus just understanding Right. You know what I'm saying? That new. Oh yeah. Hell no. I'm not endorsing any of the, the behavior. You know, it's not, it's not really our fault what happens to us in that, in that situation, particularly as children, but it is our responsibility. Right. And it, you know, there is consequences for actions. Thankfully what happened to me from, from mum and dad, none of it justified, you know, at that point, cutting them out of my life, but I certainly limited exposure and I realized very quickly when I was unable to fix everyone around me that the only way I was going to make any great change was by leading by example, right? It was the only way I could do it. And, and that's sort of that, you know, I had to keep them at arm's length at time. My mother, I would speak once, once a year for, you mm -hmm. know, probably six or seven years. And uh, I just couldn't be around her. She was still deeply damaged at that point. Incidentally, you know, both sides of the family suffered from bipolar disorder the, the thing that really started to improve everything in this, in this whole subject 
was when I got my diet sorted and started mucking around with carnivore and like heavy meat based keto. And then my mum could see what was going on. She implemented that in her own uh, nutrition regimen. And no shit, her mental health started improving and she became a better person to hang around. She's actually tolerable at times, you know? You know, that's so interesting you say that because, uh, and the primal part of the audience that's listening will totally understand this, but a lot of people go to primal paleo and omnivore, carnivore-ish type of ancestral diet. And a lot of people do it for mental health because of how it affects blood glucose and cortisol and all of these things. And, um, you know, there are even mental health providers that become primal health coaches so that they can help their clients because, you know, you can give someone a pill or whatever, but if they're still on this carbohydrate dependency sort of sugar train, then the moods are going to be up and down, right? You know how it is. Everyone knows when you, if you eat a bowl of pasta at, at noon, you're going to be wanting to sleep by two, you know what I mean? And so how does that, right? That doesn't contribute to a really uh, robust <laughs> inner life and or motivation, and, um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about now. I love that you do mention in your book. You're like, look, if you could do one thing, get rid of all of these shitty oils, right? We've are, I mean, and, and the audience here really knows about that, right? The canola, yeah. the, this, the, that, the soys, um, what, how long did it take you when you, when you shifted your diet, how long were you like, oh, hold on a minute. Uh, my brain's waking up. I feel different. So when I went to school, L, I struggled academically terrible like i failed fifth form twice i got two exact same scores two years in a row with the same curriculum and it wasn't because i was an idiot all right i was eating veggie mite fucking sandwiches and <laughs> and I, I was eating food that my body should not have been eating right when i started this healing journey the thing that really kicked it off i saw a an interview on joe rogan's um, podcast with Dr. Chris Cresser. Mm -hmm. And this is in 2016. And he spoke about the link between gluten intolerance and heartburn. And I had suffered from gastrointestinal reflux disorder. Good. You know, right. this crippling autoimmune disease for 17 years that I'd been dependent on pharmaceutical drugs for, which I'd been told no less than 20 times by some of the smartest doctors that I'd ever had access to that it was incurable. And when I cut it out, I lost three pounds of visceral fat stuffed in and around my organs. And I can verify that because I got a DEXA scan mm -hmm. before I quit it and, and three months after, right? But then my brain fog lifted. And then I started being able to reason better. And then my cognitive ability started to improve. And I was like, what else are these motherfuckers wrong about? <laughs> and, and that led me down to carnivore. And so people say to me, because I lost 60 pounds of body fat, by the way, and I put on 30 pounds of, of lean muscle mass and half a kilo of skeletal bone density. Now you can talk to any doctor and ask them how often that happens. And I guarantee you, they won't know anyone, all right? What I hypothesize, and I've spoken to a number of people far smarter than me in this subject, is that the omeprazole, the SOMAC, the LOSEC, the heartburn medication that I was taking is known for preventing or, and causing malabsorption of iron, B12 and calcium. Mm. And I think that my body was was leaching calcium or minerals out of my skeletal system over the course of those 17 years, plus with all the boozing and the cocaine and the pills and all the other shit that I was doing. And then my body, when I put it in a, in a homeostatic space and I was giving it species appropriate food, it started to heal. And, and that started, and I put on all this lean and that's where, you know, my, my sleep, I was tracking all my sleep. I was getting two, two, three hours of REM sleep every night. And, and, and I was able to bounce back after like massive, you know, athletic efforts. And, but the, the one thing that I would, if you made me pick one thing out of it was the mental health component, mm -hmm. because at that very time I was dealing with some major stuff in my life. And then when I met my now wife, Anna, you know, within three months of us meeting, she got pregnant, had an ectopic pregnancy that nearly killed her. Simultaneously, I'd started a new business venture at that time when I worked in recruitment. And over the next 12 months, my business nearly went bankrupt four times. And at that time, Anna had like six miscarriages. Oh. And then, and, and collectively we've had 16 consecutive miscarriages. She said two ectopics. Now the last one, the, the last one was not as severe and didn't nearly kill her. But then I had all that. And then, you know, as I was completely destitute and broke, COVID hit. <laughs> and, and people, and I know people can't see me when they're listening to this, but I asked people, do I look like someone who's suffering from adversity? Do I look like someone who's battling? 
No. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm not. You've met me, right? I'm not because I'm bolstered by this unwavering belief in being able to achieve anything. And and people say, what's your superpower, Laban? It's fucking steak. It's, it's red meat. <laughs> I tell you that. I tell you that. And people can laugh and we can have a bit of fun with it, but I'm deadly serious. My diet has underpinned my healing from drinking and drugs and gambling and all the other toxic shit, right? It absolutely has. And you can't convince me otherwise. Yeah, no. Well, and that's the story for so many people, including myself. And it's just what, what it's an incredible transformation that literally is at one's absolute control, right? It's what you're putting in your mouth. Um, Okay. With, with some of these struggles you mentioned earlier, like dealing with women, right? Not very great. <laughs> not, great. Not, <laughs> not, not so great. Uh, you do tell a lot of stuff in the book that makes someone go, okay, yeah, this guy was on the wrong train. <laughs> how, how do you, it, it, how do you think about this in terms of how do you see yourself as the kind of man you were when dealing with women and, and what changed, what helped you, what were some of the things that I guess probably led you to be more of what you would consider like a true, you know, sort of like alpha man. And I mean that in a positive way, not in the yeah. like beer can smashing on the forehead way that people think I think alpha is an extremely positive term and it's misused, but it seems like you probably went from a little bit of a struggling drunky beta <laughs> people, please. <laughs> To, to maybe more of that, what we consider to be like manly traits. And so tell us about that transition and, and some of the things that came up for you that you noticed in your behavior, your personality and dealing with women. Yeah. I think maybe the term might be more functional, functional mm. man, right? Like, mm -hmm. so it, it took a little while. I, I remember finding a book called how to be a 3% man by Corey Wayne. And, you know, looking back at his stuff now, I'm not aligned to it at all, but even before that, I remember getting a copy of the game reading oh, that and, and, by Neil and Strauss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and he's a local here in Malibu. And actually before I worked for Marxist and I had an opportunity to work for him. And so I did have a conversation with him and then I was just like laughing later about all that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, again, it, it is laughable for me now, but it really set me on this path. <clears throat> and uh, my father was a grew up as a child of a, in a loveless um, marriage and he never witnessed a functional masculine energy in the family. His older brother's gay, right? And like, so he didn't have any any idea about how to deal with women. And he he met my mother. He was a really successful radio announcer in New Zealand growing up. And my mother rang up and requested hot chocolates, you sexy thing, on the radio one time. <laughs> and they and they got to get, got together. And my mother already had a kid from a previous marriage, and she was very domineering. So all I observed was this very dysfunctional relationship. My father was incapable of um, setting clear boundaries and my mother would overstep them all the time. So I had to de-learn all of what I'd observed and then relearn functional ways of doing it. And it, you know, it took a, it took a hell of a, a long time to really get it to a point where, and you could ask my wife what she thinks of me, right? Like, She's my number one fan. And, and that took a lot of work, but it was all me. It was all the healing on me that I needed to do, but I needed to have access to the tools and the resources. And I know you've had Dr. Robert Glover on a number of times. He's, I've had him on my show as well. I absolutely adore that man and the work that he's done. Yeah. But I've read countless books and watched stuff on, on the internet and garnered the best for me to help me. So whatever I got from the game, whatever I got from Corey Wayne, whatever I got from, you know, no more Mr. Nice Guy, whatever I got from, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, you know, from Andrew Tate, whatever, like you take, you take what you intuitively feel needs to have happen and you can tell whether it's working or not because the women will either come or go out of your life and they'll give you a hell of a feedback in the process if you're not. <laughs> Is there uh can you give us a, can you think of an example of maybe a situation that you would have handled differently as your old self, but that came up in your sort of new refined self that you noticed, you know, where, you know, like sometimes you'll, you'll have a scenario and you'll be like, oh, you know what? I realized that, you know, 10 years ago, I might not have made the decision this way, or I wouldn't have spoken up here. And you kind of can see that difference. 
Is there something within your relationship uh, with your wife at the very beginning or now or in general that you kind of look back and go, that's funny. My old self would have done this differently. Yeah, there's a couple of things. But the first thing really that that comes to mind is honesty. I I read a book um, by Mark Manson called Models. Whenever I say Mark Manson, they always people always think the subtle art of not giving a fuck, right? Which is a great book. But he wrote another book, and I think it came afterwards, called Models. It's Attracting Women Through Honesty. And I read that in 2017, and I was like, huh, what? I can tell women the truth, <laughs> right? And and that really, you know, because I, I had a – I'd lived a life, Elle, and I'd had periods in my life where I'd experienced where – I, where I experimented with the same sex. I'd had maybe like 10 gay experiences, right, when I was always high on pills and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, am I gay? Am I bi? Whatever. And uh, and I was really ashamed of these experiences. And my when I had revealed some of that stuff to former girlfriends, it had gone down like a lead balloon. Yeah. And so I was mortified of telling Anna this. But I said to her when we got together, because all of my friends knew about it. Well, it was common knowledge, right? When, it, uh, when when we got together, I said, Anna, you can ask me anything you like as long as you're happy to hear the answer. So inevitably, it came up maybe about six months into our relationship. Now, Anna's from Russia, right? Homosexuality is still on the, uh, <laughs> still reintegrating. That's on the hit her, list, yeah. Right? That's not, nobody's accepting that. <laughs> and and uh, when she first heard, it really negatively affected her. I can imagine now, but she got over it and she accepted me and we moved on and, and we, you know, we leaned back into our, our greatness. Well, 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 a year and a half later, after a, a breakdown that, that Anna had had, she reveals to me, and I'm going to share something pretty heavy here that from the age of 15 until she was 21, that she would had been systematically sexually abused by a stepfather growing up in Russia that had resulted in two pregnancies and two forced illegal abortions, one of which damaged the uterine wall and was likely the culprit for all of the miscarriages, right? Mm. Now, I was the second person in 20-odd years that Anna had revealed that information to. The only other person was a young girl when she was 15 when it first happened. Now, the beautiful thing about that story and the reason I wanted to share that with you, and I have Anna's permission, she's got her own podcast called the world's best trauma recovery podcast. And she is, she is healed from this, right? Is that she was able to start her healing journey because of the balls and the courage that I had to be honest about something that deeply shamed me. Oh, well, I want to stop right there. Cause that just gave me goosebumps. That's the power of vulnerability and sharing and just being unafraid. And if you're not accepted, you're not, but again, how someone else's vulnerability can even open up someone else. 1000% Al. greatest thing I ever did was to have the confidence and the courage and the self-belief and the intuitive knowledge to know that I needed to be honest. And, and as a result, it built a level of trust that I've never seen in any form of relationship and hardly ever see with any of the other people that I, that I coach and the relationships that they have with their, their significant other, others. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I, uh, my own story too of that is it, it held me up so long being ashamed about having a hand, you know, permanent hand injury because I have a disability you can't see. And that really tripped me up in relationships because I could not be vulnerable about that. I'd feel someone would reject me. I'm sure as you, right? If you tell them the story, mm-hmm. you're going to get rejected. So therefore you hide it. Now you're hiding something that breeds awful vibes. It's just, it's, mm-hmm. it's in there. It's in the ether. It's not good. And it really wasn't, it really wasn't until I finally was able to open up about that and just be, have no shame about my shame like you, that then the relationship piece opened up and flowered. You know what I mean for me? And so it's just so important to get flat with it. Not that you have to go talk about it on podcasts like we are, right? <laughs> but, but that you but that you get flat with it somehow, whether it's a therapist or a coach or yourself. Yeah. Well, the, the more that I share it, and just, just to your point regarding, you know, you don't, have, you don't have to share it, but the more you speak these things out in, in real world, the less power they hold right and the the better and the more comfortable you get sharing it it is really important though to be around the right kind of people that are going to lift you up and not cast judgment all right 
Because if everyone took that truth serum and blurted out all of the shenanigans they've got up to, no one would have anything clean in the closet. And, you know, I'm in Utah here and, and some of my clients are, are from the Mormon faith and there's, you know, I love the Mormon people, but there, there's so much shame in admitting guilt or admitting fault um, because of the whole structure of, you know, how to get into heaven with, with the religion. Yeah. And, and also or, the perfection element. That's why Utah is literally number one, even over Hollywood for plastic surgery, which is a very strange fact. Is it really? Yes. And it <laughs> also amazing. is the top for antidepressants and things like that. And again, just and, and knowing knowing some ex Mormons and the way that that is, there's just again this like, hey, I have, I'm happy, we're all happy, perfect life, and it's a little bit of that appearances thing. And yeah. you know, when you're in that, and when you're swimming in appearances, you're not getting real with some of the stuff. So I can see that. Yeah. Well, I've had some powerful. I've mean, only been here a month. <laughs> had some powerful experiences where people, and I won't mention any names, have just verbally diarrhea you know, stuff they've never told anyone to me within minutes of meeting me because I don't think they meet anyone who's so comfortable sharing all of their, their stuff so effortlessly and that they have a sense of relief. It's like they've had a, like an orgasm, a non-sexual orgasm of sorts, you know, it's like the relief, unbelievable, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe that's-, that's why I've been called here. Maybe that's why I've been called here. It was a very energetic pull. So tell us, um, you said, you know, you've been like sober from all of these things that were holding you down for all of these years. And you said you haven't since and you're fairly easy. Has there been blips along the way where you needed to like call a counselor or an addiction person or were there moments? Um, and what were those moments like if they showed up? So I, I need to clarify something um, because of something that just happened uh, last week. Um, to answer your question about the blips, no, I haven't. I, I never went through any 12-step, never went through any program of sorts. I had access to the to the gambling psychologist, but that was it. All the rest of it was self-taught. And, and I know that's an anomaly, and I know people need that at times. But for me, I was able to not, u- not use it. The caveat that I wanted to make, I just came back from a plant medicine healing retreat that I did with my wife literally two weeks ago. And that involved... Um, rape, which is like a traditional tobacco, which is, you know, it's not a psychotropic or anything, medical grade MDMA and uh, psilocybin. And, and, and before I, I didn't, I really grappled with like, is this considered a relapse? And then I've, I've the research and the work that I've been doing with all the healing that we've been going through. Right. And we still, there's still plenty to be done. I was like, this is totally not the same thing at all. And it was administered in such a way that had a profound healing effect on me and my wife. And, you know, one of the, one of the main side effects, you mentioned drinking your coffee when we were off, off camera before, like I came back, I was a big coffee. I drink a pot of French press every morning. Right. <laughs> I came back from that retreat L zero desire to, to have coffee. And I, I haven't had a, not even gone near it since. And I had no withdrawal from it either. And, and I did deep healing with, with some family members and stuff that was on this, on this healing journey. So that's the caveat. I just, I want to be truthful with people um, so that I'm in alignment. That that's what, that's what's happened. So if you want to call that a blip, you can call it a blip, but that's not how I would, I would look at it. Right. Yeah. I know there's a lot of people who've recovered from things like that and then go into a, a traditional sort of monitored situation like that for the purposes of healing PTSD. And, and it has had miraculous effects on a lot of people. Um, betting on you. So if someone's out there and they're down, maybe they don't have the, the drug and the gambling problem, but they just don't have the courage to go out in life and pursue what they want to pursue. Where do they start and what are some lessons and bits that you can uh, share? Well, there's two questions I want to ask that person, right? You know, how's that working out for you? And what's your life going to look like a year from now if you keep doing the same damn thing, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, the, the people that I coach, they are really in huge amounts of emotional pain and they are ready to do something about it. You've got to be ready. You got to meet people where they're at. But like, if you are ready and you want to do something, start, start educating yourself, start learning from people that have achieved what you want to achieve. Don't take advice from people that are operating out of alignment, that don't have the the proper credibility to to have experienced what you're about to go through. That, That would be my encouragement. There's a lot of snake oil people out there. There's a lot of really great people out there too. There's a lot of people out there that are ready to capitalize 
start tapping into your intuition. Start listening to your universe. I'm not religious in any capacity. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I'm deeply spiritual. And, and my intuition now is proving itself to be never wrong. And that puts me in a very powerful position to know that what I'm doing, it's in alignment. You know, I'm well on my way to being known as the world's most positively influential speaker by being the world's best courage coach. And I teach people how to take bold, massive and courageous action to facilitate their own miraculous outcomes. And I do that by my speaking and my coaching and my, my writing and the podcast. So what's your, what's your reason for being on the planet? What, why did the universe put you here? I bet it's not to be working some god awful nine to five job where you go and get hammered on a Friday night just to drown your sorrows from the previous four days. It's service. It's, it's giving back. It's using your own experiences as, as fuel, reclaiming your power and operating in integrity and in an alignment. You don't have to be perfect, but at least you're striding towards it, making the world a better place, yo. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's interesting you said that because you know in a lot of the, it's a like a lot in the health industry too. You know you have some, and again I'm not anyone who's got great knowledge and can help people with their health. Fantastic, but there has been so many comments made where people are like, "Am I gonna really take advice from the person who never had a like always was fit or like the 20 year old that's never had an issue yet, or am I gonna take it from <laughs> the 55 year old who's still wearing her bikini? Maybe I should, maybe she's the one, <laughs> right? But in general, what we are talking about is yes, if someone get advice from people who've been through what you've been through, it might not be as inspiring to read the autobiography of someone who was given a hundred million dollars at birth versus someone who made it themselves, but it could be. Um, but again, <laughs> I, I, I like what you're saying. It's look for people that have overcome what you are dealing with, because there are so many, so many authors, so many people. And again, half the stuff's for free. If you can't even afford a book, Google the name of the author in an interview. I'm sure you're going to get <laughs> a million wonderful pieces from that interview alone, right? So I agree with that. It's it's like, if you want to become a painter, well, yeah, you could start off with a YouTube video for watercolors, go get a few dumb paints at the store, you know, but you got to start somewhere. And again, I that's what I did when I, I started reading books about people who you know, had achieved greatness and had come from nothing or whatever it was to inspire me. And so I think that that's what your, your book and your story does as well. Well, I, I want to acknowledge you, Elle, because what people don't see is the untold amounts of work and effort that it takes for you to get to where you are in your life. And if you're listening to this for the first time and you haven't subscribed, you haven't gone and given this, this podcast a rating, Go and do it right now. Share it with people that you care about because the only way that this message gets out, all right, and it's not a super, super popular message, all right, particularly with mainstream narratives because there's no money in being able to heal people this way. Send it to people that you truly care about and say, hey, I've been thinking about you. thought this might be a value. You're not trying to fix them. You're not trying to solve their problems. But we need... We need people to take bold, massive, and courageous action. And maybe that's just sharing a damn podcast. It's that simple. Elle's blood, sweat, and tears. You know, you've gone through your own magnificent journey. And, you know, very blessed to have you as a guest on my show as well. I loved hearing your story and, and the work that you're doing. So just want to acknowledge you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. No, it's, it's always fun to have these conversations. And I always love it when people have made it to the other side. And we're still going. This work doesn't stop. Um, tell me about your life now in terms of what's your day like? Do you have a morning routine? What's, your, what's the way that you get into the right vi vibes? And when something comes up, when you get, mm, yeah, you know how we just, you know, you're about to fall down that spiral staircase and you got to like turn it around. <laughs> what are some of your tips? <laughs> and what do you do internally when you're having those moments and you see it go in that direction and you need to go, okay, let's get back to the right vibe. <laughs> so I don't really have a routine of any significance. I, what I do prioritize is, is nutrition and exercise. Now I, I, uh, I don't run as much as I used to. I'm back in the gym lifting heavy weights and, and I really, my body responds to that magnificently. You know, the running can be pretty hard on the cortisol side of things. Um, it's going to be interesting now that I don't drink coffee. Um, I'm very keen to get some body weight down and get back running again. But really, I prioritize mindfulness, a lot of gratitude and empathy, and you know, spending a lot of time with the people that lift me up. I have become ruthless at cutting toxic people out of my life. And yeah. Yes. Let's talk about that. Cancel right. all of these motherfuckers. <laughs> including family and people are like, you can't do that. Your family. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Yeah. And you need to. 
And it's not that you you don't love these people anymore, but if someone doesn't serve you well, and I'll give you the example, you know, the relationship with my father over the last couple of years has completely really dissolved because he's operating at a way different vibrational frequency than me. He doesn't believe in what I'm doing. He, mm. he thinks that I'm a, I'm a fruitcake and, <laughs> you know, truly. And so as a result, I'm like, do you know what? I don't need to be around this because it's it depletes me of my life force being around that kind of environment. And I still love my dad. And, I, you know, like I said, I've forgiven him. But, like, I choose not to spend any time with them. Now, I did that with a number of other friends and family. And here's the beautiful thing. Because I've been doing this long enough now, Al, people are starting to come back into my life. They're starting to send me private messages saying, hey, I've been seeing what you're doing on social media, seeing what you're doing. I just wanted to say great work. And these people have never liked a post. They've never commented or anything. Right. And then they're like, Hey, how are you doing? Like, what's this thing that you're doing? Can you show me how to do this? And so I've had a number of family members, extended family members and some friends that have come back into my life because they're naturally inquisitive and they are seeing that I'm thriving, you know, like life's not without its challenges, L, but for the most part, my life is unbelievably blessed, unbelievably blessed. And and it's because I'm operating within integrity, within alignment, and I'm doing what, what I'm supposed to be doing on this goddamn planet. Yeah. Living by example is the best you can do. You know, it's the same thing with health. So we have had this conversation, you know, over the years on several podcasts where it's like, once you learn about something that's amazing, like what's changed your life with health and your brain, and you know, you see the way that you're eating. And then it's like, people have this, they want to impart it on everyone they know. And guess what? It can breed negativity because those people aren't fucking ready. It's the same thing with positive mindset, right? Once someone realizes positive thinking or the power of intention, and then it's like, you want to go share it with your negative friend. And guess what? It's going to backfire. And you think, well, gee, how could spreading positivity breed this negative. Yeah. Because you're, you're, you're pushing that on someone who's not ready. And so I've just learned, like, I, you know, it, to this day and age of some, like an old friend from back in the day texts me and they're like, Hey, uh, I saw your book. Like, what's this paleo thing? I'm like, here, you know, go, go research. Like, I don't have the time. I'm not going to sit here, and lecture, <laughs> you know, like, let's see how badly you want it. You go figure it out. And I've, I've, we've all done that, right. We've, we've spent time trying to help the needy, not the worthy, right? Or or the people that aren't ready. And so it's like, you finally get to the point where you're like, I'll just let people come to me. You know what I mean? If they really want to know about this, that's great. I'm going to live by example because you and I have people who pay us for this, right? Who are ready, who are, you know, in on it. And so the other people, we don't have to convince, right? And I think that that's an important message to lay off people. You know, once you get excited about something, stay there, enjoy it, and and don't try to proselytize it, right? Do you know what I'm saying? Because it, 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 I'm sure you've had that experience yourself. Yeah, in the early days, absolutely became yeah. evangelical. But, I, you know, I won't make any apologies for that. It, it triggered some people, um, but it, what's been vindicated now is that I was fucking right. <laughs> you know That's right. Like? That's right. And, and, you know, my, I, uh, I got an auntie uh, in Australia. She's in her late sixties now. She's been really, she was obese all her life and has um, went plant-based for the animals. And when I, when I oh, first boy. learned about this, you know, how good I felt on the, on the um, carnivore diet, I, I messaged her and said, Hey, can I share this um, amazing experience with you and you know, trying to help and i told her what i was doing and she's you're gonna fucking die eating all that fucking me <laughs> right and and flew off the handle at me and uh i was like whoa <laughs> right mm -hmm. and uh and then then just went you know she she doesn't she doesn't want help like right. she really doesn't want help and you get better at it, right? You get better at, at monitoring the situation. You get better at reading the situation. I have conversations with people, random people at supermarkets and shops and cafes and restaurants all the time about this knowledge because it comes up somehow. It comes up somehow. And I will share, you know, freely share this information, but I don't jam it down their throats. And the people that are naturally inquisitive will want more. Those that are triggered by it will, you know, they're not really attracted into my life anymore, if I'm honest. Yeah. And, and, and that I get, I'm deeply rewarded by that. Al. I, you know, I get messages from people all the time now saying, Hey, we had a conversation like a year ago and I've lost 50 pounds and I'm doing all this stuff. And it's like, 
I couldn't even remember who the, who I'm talking to, you know, like, mm-hmm. it's like, Hey, that's fucking cool. That that's me. And, and that comes from an attitude of going into every single interaction that I have with what value can I possibly add this person's life? What value can I add this person's life? You know, the, the, the law of reciprocity. And there's a great book called the go giver by Bob Berg and John David Mann, which is a book that I would highly recommend that everyone read. It's about being able to have the life of your dreams by uh by giving and that that has really changed that whole dynamic the proselytizing and the that doesn't really happen in the same way anymore and i don't know i've I'm, i've got boundless energy i'm i'm an upbeat positive optimistic human being who's incredibly physically strong mentally emotionally and spiritually these days and i think that speaks for itself in many cases Let's talk about a few sort of client success stories, some one eighties at the top of your mind of people who, you know, came to you and were just as, you know, at that same level before you bet on yourself and uh, what was the outcome? Well, I suppose one of my favorite stories is uh, I started coaching a guy earlier this year, who's a 52 year old Mormon guy. And he had been married for 27 years. He came up to me, he didn't even know what I did. At a, at a conference and he said you must coach me and i was like right <laughs> hmm. and he uh, we arranged to meet the next day at my home and this guy grew up he's a he's a white guy but he was adopted by hispanic parents when he was a young boy and there was all sorts of you know abandonment issues still some legacy stuff there as well raised in the mormon faith married he also adopted a child, him and his wife, and he grew up without any strong masculine role model either. And if they weren't Mormon, when I said to him, you know, if you guys weren't in the faith, how long ago would you guys have gotten divorced? <laughs> it was like, you know, right. 26 and a half years ago. <laughs> right. But but because of the the commitment, right, like they were like, and his wife was exiting the Mormon faith so she could go and be with another guy. Right. And so when he came to me, we just, you know, the first thing I made him do was to read my book and to watch the interview I did with Robert Glover. He'd actually read Dr. Robert Glover's book, No One Was a Nice Guy. And he was the epitome of a nice guy. And, and then we started to do some work on, on, boundary settings and putting his own needs first and he was doing a job that he fucking hated and you know, like like the the cliche the cliche case and watch watching that man transform has been one of the most re- rewarding experiences of my life i got a message not long after we started working together saying laban you saved my marriage and and all it was was he started operating it with an integrity and putting his own needs first for once and, uh, and, and started reattracting his wife because he was behaving like a functional man. Mm-hmm. And, you know, still lots of work to, to be done. We're still working together. But that was one of my, you know, amazing moments. He's just, he's just one of the most beautiful human beings you've ever met. And, and he was doing everything he thought was right. And it was the opposite. And you, you see this all the time, Al. Like people are just like, how, do, how am I supposed to do this life thing, right? I'm doing everything that I've been told we should be doing and it's blowing up in my face and it's it's really heartbreaking to see, but it can be resolved very quickly. You just need someone who can help shortcut that experience. You need someone who is a champion of you in your corner. My, my coaching clients all hear the same thing. You will never be belittled by me. You'll never be undermined or or berated by me. Yes. I'm the cut man in a corner. I'm there with the cold steel to keep your eye open when you've been punched in the face so you can stay in the fight. All right. And and that's sometimes what people need. And I listen without judgment because when you come from being a degenerate like I was. That's right. There's like, no judgment. There's yeah. no fucking judgment. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I've been, you know, I, I, I got kicked out of high school. I was a total shithead, you know, for like so many. <laughs> so when I look back, I'm like, I, I, no one's ever going to be judged by me on behavior or anything else for that matter. <laughs> um, similar. Okay. So let's, <clears throat> let's talk about, well, first of all, let, tell us about your podcast and your book bet on you. Where can we get that? And of course we'll put everything to connect with you in the show notes, but tell us how you work with people and what you have to offer so we can gain more from this wonderful energy and uh, courageous vibes. 
Well, the, the podcast is called Become Your Own Superhero. And the, the, the premise of that really was to speak to people that have an amazing story that will empower, inspire, and motivate people to take action for themselves, right? So often, you know, people love Marvel and they love all these comics and stuff and they love living vicariously through, through all these other heroes. And it's like, well, what about if I'm the hero? And, and so the, the show really, there's no specific genre. It's everyone, authors and speakers and athletes and movie stars and anyone that I find inspiring. So and that's, that's available on YouTube and everywhere else you can get podcasts. Um, I think maybe the best thing is to text the word courage to double three, triple seven. If you're in the U S double three, triple seven text courage. And, and, and uh, I'm, I'm running a number of these free um, masterminds or masterclasses on on courage on a course in courageousness and we've got some dates coming up but they're, they're ongoing so whenever people hear this you know if it's a year down the road it'll still be relevant that's really the best thing i can suggest you know the, the book um i'm really proud of the book i wrote it during the lockdown it was inspired by les brown who's one of the greatest motivational speakers on the planet who wrote the forward for it and so it gave me the blueprint for the book and um I recorded it in my voice in a beautiful studio in Charlottenburg in Berlin in 2021 and uh, had a hell of a time doing it. So if you like my dulcet tones, you can consume it that way. Otherwise, it's available in paperback or uh, Kindle. Well, I think everyone listening, hearing how incredibly no BS vulnerable you've been about your trials and tribulations is in and of itself impressive. And I think um, and just, yeah, grateful for that. There's, uh, there's so many people that are listening that are resonating with some of that potential fear of shame. And the other things you've talked about in your book is things that can hold us back. And I love all the work that you're doing. So everybody tune in to his podcast and go get a copy of his book. Is there anything you'd like to leave our audience with on this topic of being courageous or anything else? Yeah, it's a, it's a great quote from Les Brown. Well, at least I think it's from Les Brown. He's, he uses it all the time. And it's what people think of me is none of my business. Mm -hmm. What people think of me is none of my business. And I know that is challenging at times, right? But truly, like people aren't thinking about us anywhere near as much that's as right. we think they yeah, do. No, that's right? totally true. Nobody gives a shit about you but you, really. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. And when you realize that, trying to keep up with the Joneses, you know, what if I, what if I give up alcohol? What are the neighbors going to think of that? Am I not going to invite who gives a fuck? Like put your own needs first for one, sort your own shit out. You're only on this planet once in this lifetime. All right. Have some fun while you're here. Be inspiring to other people. That's the real fulfillment. People think about getting lots of money, getting the job and the family and stuff, working a million hours a week, being deeply unrewarded, right? Fulfillment is when you get a message from someone saying, Hey, Laban, what you wrote in your book stopped me from taking my own life, all right? Or what you wrote in your book allowed me a pathway to start my own healing journey. That is what I believe is what people are actually searching for, not all the other bullshit. Yeah, and if you did give a shit about what other people thought, you wouldn't be able to tell your story to have someone even be able to write you and say <laughs> how much they've right. So it's important if you have you have to get into vulnerability and authenticity and no shame about your shame in order to share a story that can help others. I mean, I think that that's what holds people back. I mean, when I, when I mentor other writers and we're working on like a book or something, the biggest thing that comes up is what it, they are. They're already at the end in their mind of when they publish it and what people will think of it. It's amazing. You know, it's like, really? it's, it's always, yeah. It's like, they go right to like, well, what will people think when I, or even if it's not a controversial book or anything, it's just, again, this, this impediment of what other people's opinions might be of it. And that is like a lot of the work other than yes, helping them develop a, a, a product, a, you know, a book, but it's that, like, that's most of it right there is that courageous or confidence, you know, the ability to so go, who cares? I'm going to get it out anyway. And whatever people think of it, it's not, it's not really any of my business. So I'm really glad we ended on that. <laughs> Because well, just, just and just on that, you know, when Anna shared with me what happened to her, by the way, she swore me to secrecy. 
uh, one of my one of my areas of development, L, is uh, wasn't able to keep a secret very well, and I did share it with a mentor friend of mine, a female friend of mine, and uh, after Anna's um, agitation and aggression wore off, she actually became very grateful that I was able to start sharing it. So use your intuition, you know. But people don't write books because of what their mother might think of them. Like seriously, right. Grow some stones. <laughs> and we'll end on that. That's great. Well, thank you so much for coming by and everybody uh, connect with uh, Laban in the show notes and check out his podcast and book. Thanks so much for all the work you're doing and for this conversation. Love you and love your work, Al. You as well. All right, everyone. We'll see you next week. Hey, listeners, you know, over the years, a ton of companies have approached me to collaborate, but I will only promote companies whose products I believe in and that I actually use and consume on a regular basis. So let me tell you about some of my favorite companies that I can offer you discounts for. Rep Provisions, an amazing company doing incredible things for our planet, topsoil, and animals with regenerative agriculture. And it's my number one source for quality pasture-raised meat and chicken. Visit repprovisions.com and use code L15 for 15% off. I'm also obsessed with a company called Carnivore Crisps. They make a lean, all-natural, and delicious alternative to conventional snacking made with just real meat and real salt. Totally addictive, and my favorite ones are the beef brisket and the ribeye. Visit carnivorecrisps.com and use code PALEO10 for 10% off. I also love and regularly use Paleo Valley products. They make amazing supplements and delicious paleo products. I use the superfood greens powder, grass-fed beef sticks, the organ complex, and their bone broth bars. I love the lemon and apple. I also use their essential sea complex and more. Visit paleovalley.com forward slash promos forward slash L Russ for 15% off. I also love Primal Kitchen. They make delicious paleo-approved, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and no refined sugar products. And I use them daily, from their collagen powders and sauces and marinades to their avocado and olive oil. So good, so healthy. Visit PrimalKitchen.com and use code L10 for 10% off. I also love paleo powder and use it almost on everything I cook. They make incredible seasoning blends and they also have these incredible grain-free coatings that feel just like crispy breadings that you would have had prior to knowing that there's another way. So visit paleopowder.com and use code L15 for 15% off.